Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Games Vidicon video, we're going to be tackling two news stories, the first of which is yet another Vega rumour. This concerns code names and possible specifications of the Vega RX series, which has actually been verified by a couple of different websites, so there may be some credibility to this. And then we're going to move on to a new type of caching slash chip design which drastically improves performance. In fact, in a simulation test system with 36 cores, the Jenga CPU cache memory system has increased processing speed by up to 30% and energy efficiency by as much as 85%. Those are pretty impressive figures as I'm sure you'll agree. Anyway, let's start out with Vega. And there are three separate SKUs for Vega. At least according to the rumours by both videocards.com and 3D Center, along with Fudzilla, who have also somewhat confirmed these. Basically, each one of these websites has said that their sources are confirming what the other website said, so it looks like, in theory, that this is pretty true. Anyway, getting on to the actual specifications and the names of the card. Well, the names I'm not exactly impressed with, and hopefully they do change when the products are finally launched, because we have the AMD Radeon RX Vega XTX, XT, and finally the XL. Yep, not exactly the most wieldy of names, but still. So, what is the differences between these cards? Well, unfortunately we don't have information regarding clock speeds, that type of thing, at the moment. But what we do have is some other information. First of all, the top of the line model, which is XTX, has 4096 stream processors. Memory is being listed as 8GB with a TBP of 375 watts. And this is with an AIO. The air cooler derivative is with the XT. Once again, we don't know the clock speeds. I presume they'll be lower. Uh, we have 100 watts lower on the TB, but the stream processors are identical. The Vega XL has 3,584 stream processors, so it has a lower number, but the memory is a question mark. There are some who believe it's going to be 4 gigs. Personally, I'm not I'm not sold on that. I don't believe that that's going to be the case. Hopefully, that isn't the case, because I feel that 4 gigs, even with HBCC, that's, there is some skepticism whether uh, HBCC is going to perform as well as advertised, but let's assume it does for the sake of this video. I still feel, even if HBCC does what AMD tell us it does and drastically improves the efficiency of the code as it's being loaded into graphics memory, even if it does do that, even if it doubles it, let's just say for the sake of this video, it's still going to be a very hard sell because to the average user, they're not going to know this stuff and they're not going to really want to plonk down money on a 4 gigabyte graphics card. It's just, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it won't happen, but I'd be surprised if it did. Regardless, there is also some rumors that we're going to see a 16 gigabyte variant, but whether that's the you know, still on the cards, we don't know. Unfortunately, HBM2 is quite expensive, and because of that, it's possible that it either, it either, excuse me, may come later after launch, or B, it just may appear at launch, but you're just going to have to pay that price premium. As is probably ingrained into your brains right now, front, the Frontier Edition does run, of course, at 1600 MHz, so I'm very curious to see if... Vega XTX has drastically higher clocks. We've start, we've seen some you know co um, sorry some benchmarks and leak benchmarks would show 1630 megahertz, which is a very subtle up up clock. It's you know it's not even worth mentioning really. So are we going to see even higher? Are we going to see like 1650, 1700? That would be ideal. And I do feel that AMD obviously want to clock this as high as possible. Hence the AIO. Obviously, if they can get to like 1700 megahertz or even better 1750, they're going to stand a much better chance of at least dethroning, let's say, the 1080 by a significant margin or at least a pretty decent margin. But ultimately, it comes down to heat as well and people's tolerance of it. At the end of the day, if this GPU puts out a ridiculous amount of heat and you know, people don't feel that the performance is worth that amount of heat, then a couple of extra 100 megahertz on the clock might not make the difference. Ultimately, we're going to have to wait for the final graphics cards to appear on store shelves. Don't forget that they will be revealed at Capsation on July the 30th, 
um, which of course takes place in Sigraf. But do also remember another rumor that I covered yesterday or the day before, and that is that supposedly AIB partners will not get final BIOSes until August the 2nd. So basically at the moment they've got these pre-production BIOSes and how close they are to final revision, well, your guess is as good as mine, but even if they are pretty close to final uh final revisions of the BIOS, that doesn't help the AIB partners because obviously they need to, you know, make sure they've got a significant amount of stock before they can start sending those things off. So ultimately that is going to delay things and I wouldn't be surprised if we have to wait until, let's say, early September before a decent supply of, of uh, you know, MSI and, and uh, whomever else cards actually start appearing on the market rather than being clicked drips and drabs or AMD's own GPUs. So the next topic is Jenga, which is something that not a lot of people have been really discussing, but it is a new CPU caching memory system. Basically, researchers at MIT, uh, Science and Compu uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, I can't speak today, really annoying, have designed a program which can basically simulate an entirely new CPU design, at least in terms of cache. So according to the website, I'm going to read this out verbatim, the researchers tested their systems on simulation of a chip with 36 cores or processing units. They found that compared to its best performing predecessors, the system increased performance speed by 20 to 30 percent while reducing energy consumption by 30 to 85 percent. So for those who don't know, computer CPUs right now have multiple levels of cache. Level 1, level 2, level 3, so on and so on. Some go up to level 4. Now the difference between each level is that level 1 is smaller than level 2, but level 2 is slower than level 1. So in short, you've got this trade-off where data in level 1 is much faster to access, it has much lower latency, but there's also a lot less of it. So basically, you can't put as much data into that space. The too long didn't read of this design is that cache hierarchies are allocated basically on the fly. So each multi-core chip does still have two levels of its own local private cache, but it also has a shared third cache, which is in discrete memory banks, which are basically plonked around the chip. And sometimes they've also tested it with a fourth DRAM cache, which is basically off the chip itself. So according to the website, I'll read this once again verbatim. For a given core, accessing the nearest memory bank of the shared cache is more efficient than accessing more distant cores. Unlike today's cache memory systems, Jenga distinguishes between physical locations of the separate memory banks that make up the shared cache. For each core, Jenga knows how long it would take to retrieve that information from any on-chip memory bank, a measure known as latency. Furthermore, Jenga also features a data placement procedure, and this is because of Basically, let's say you have a large number of processor cores. Let's say you have 16, 32, what have you, and they're all trying to access data from the same DRAM cache, or you know, even multiple cores accessing, let's say two or three. What happens is obviously there is only a certain amount of bandwidth and a certain amount of data which can be accessed within a given time frame. In other words, if you have, let's say, two or four cores vying for the same piece of well, sorry, the same the same bandwidth pool, you're going to get latency. So those two processor cores, for example, may act slower than if there was only one processor core. And once again, reading verbatim, if multiple cores are retrieved, retrieving data from the same DRAM cache, this can cause bottlenecks that introduce new latencies. So after Jenga has come up with multiple set of cache assignments, cores don't simply jump all of their data to the nearest available memory banks. Instead, Jenga parcels out data a little at a time, then estimates the effect on bandwidth consumption and latency. Thus, even within the 100 millisecond intervals between chip-wide cache relocations, Jenga adjusts the priorities that give each core to the memory banks allocated to it. If this is pretty technical for you, and to be honest, I'm somewhat glazing over this because it's a very in-depth uh, paper, and frankly, I'd suggest you read it if this is your type of thing. 
Basically, it's just a lot more efficient of knowing where data is located in a particular cache and much more efficient of knowing when it should retrieve that data and reducing the chance of core contention so that things don't go awry and you have basically performance penalties. This is very, very imperative when you're dealing with ever increasing complexities of chips. Yes, most CPUs now only have four cores, but that isn't going to be the state of things for long. Ryzen has eight CPUs in, let's say, the Ryzen 7. It won't be long before this becomes commonplace. I say it won't be long in the grand scheme of things, like two or three years, and the adoption rates of Ryzen, the adoption rates of higher core CPUs is going to become pretty normal. Because of that, because Coffee Lake is going to be six cores, for example, because Intel and AMD are pushing for ever-increasing number of processor cores. And, of course, that's only on the x86 space. That isn't to take into consideration, oh, I don't know, ARM. It won't be long. And, of course, GPUs. Don't even get me started on the number of cores in a GPU. It won't be long before we really need to start worrying about more efficient caching systems. In fact, memory bandwidth and contention has definitely become a big problem, even on Ryzen. It's one of the reasons that faster RAM really does make a difference in Ryzen, or even reduce, reducing, excuse me, the, um, the, the timings of your memory. Like, tighter timings definitely do make a difference not in all applications i'll grant you and there are cutoffs especially in certain applications like in directx 11 if you go above certain ram speeds with certain timings you're going to hit the law of diminishing returns but in multi-threading applications you definitely do notice those differences with all of that said hopefully you have enjoyed the video my good friend i shall see you soon take care bye for now